church. Um, Pastor, we'll have your permission. One minute. Um, I think we should just take a minute. One of the things that we, as believers, don't seem to realize is that God is our Father. And He's not an irresponsible Father. If we can bow our heads this morning, if there's anything, anything you want to ask your dad for, I think, I know he's here. Why don't you just ask him before I sing this morning? Whatever it is, just ask simply, and he will answer. In a sentence or two, just ask him. Some of you may know, so you can join me.
Thank you, praise team. Great job this morning. How's everybody feel this morning? Good. Good? Got an extra hour of sleep, right? <laughs> Some are going, yeah, and Ray's going, no. <clears throat> you know, what I realized is that it's lunchtime right now. <laughs> I'm kind of hungry. You know, it's, uh, it's supposed to be. This time last week, you were getting ready to leave and go find something to eat and, and that. I wondered, as I was preparing for this message, I wonder where Jesus and his disciples ate after they ministered. I mean, there weren't many Dairy Queens with a five dollar, five buck meal. Wasn't many Wendy's with a four by four. 
not many Mexican restaurants, and oh, I don't even know how this works. There wasn't many Ming Hings around. <coughs> that was, uh, that's terrible to even think about. How did they live back then? <coughs> the other thing is, where did they get their money? Ever wonder where Jesus, who ministered for three years, got his money to be able to eat every day? <laughs> he fished. All right. You know, nowhere in Scripture does it say where, uh, where that Jesus ever went and took up an offering for his own ministry. It doesn't say that he, uh, he had resources. In fact, uh, I'd put down the fishermen left their boats. Maybe they still knew how to fish. They had a cane pole over on the side of the water. Maybe so. <clears throat> tax collector left his tax booth, didn't he? So uh, he didn't have the money. Where did that money come for them to have food and clothes? Sometimes you go into a restaurant and you see a sign that's, uh, that's back by the kitchen that says, employees only. Or you'll see a, a sign that says, staff only. And you know that you're not to go back behind the, the door there. That's not for you to see. Well, there's a passage in scripture here to so look at in Luke's gospel, that it pulls the curtain back just a little bit and we're able to go back in to where it says employees only. And we get to see just how Jesus was cared for for the three years of his ministry. It's amazing. It really is. And so if you have your scripture, turn with me to Luke's gospel, chapter 8. It's found in three verses. Three verses, if you read them like I read them, you fly by those and don't think another thought about them. We're going to think a thought about them today. And so if you have found Luke chapter 8, stand with me as we begin reading verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from town from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. And these women were helping to support them out of their own means. You may be seated. This passage of scripture says that Jesus, after these things, after this, after what? After the events of Luke chapter 7. After the events in which he heals a centurion's servant after he rises from the dead a widow's son after he talks to John the Baptist's disciples who have come to wonder if he's really the Messiah after he has been anointed by a sinful woman he begins this time of traveling from one town, one village to another, and he is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. It never ceases to amaze me that in the three years of his ministry, how much Jesus really accomplished. In three years, at the time in which it ends, all the religious leaders had rejected him. They had decided that they were not going to believe that he was indeed who he said he was. And in fact, at the end of three years, he would have his life taken from him. But yet he had set in motion in those three short years a powerful force of truth that would last until today. It would change the lives of people in that area in such a way that the word would go out from that Jerusalem where he was risen and where he would say, wait upon the Holy Spirit. 
The word would go out from there and would cover all the known world. And in the known world then would go from generation to generation to generation to generation to us here today. James Allen wrote these words almost 100 years ago and they're as true today as they were in the day in which he penned them. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village as a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 and then for three years was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, he never held office. He never owned a home, he never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompanies greatness. He had no credentials except himself. He had nothing to do with this world except the naked power of his divine manhood. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. He, turned, he was turned over to his enemies. He went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he owned on earth, and that at his dying, which was his coat. And when he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is still the center of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that have ever marched and all the navies that have ever built and all the parliaments that have ever sat and all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon the earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. Wow. You think about it. Today, all across this world, people are gathering in the name of Jesus. 2,000 years ago, died on the cross for the sins of the world and we still worship him today. That Jesus was going from place to place. He wasn't going by himself though. He was going with 12 disciples. I often thought, <clears throat> how did they work that? You know, because when I see them going, I saw that Jesus and the 12 were going. I never really thought about them eating. Although when I did, I thought who was gonna be the cook? Maybe I thought about that because I don't have a cook right now. Uh, but I really, I really want to thank you ladies for helping out in, uh, in bringing meals. You guys are great, great chefs. And I thank you for it. And for the visits and the cards and the prayers, I echo Linda's gratitude. It's been, it's been amazing. Jesus' message going from town to town. That's what it means to be itinerant pastor. He didn't come to the Jerusalem Baptist Church as the Orville Baptist Church. And he didn't come every Sunday and set up behind a pulpit. He went from town to town, to village to other village, to be able to proclaim the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God had a message in it. And the message was involving these three women who are mentioned by name and many others who were with him. Because they all have these three things in common according to the passage that we just read. All three of them have come to know Jesus personally. They've come to know him personally. Each one of them has been healed, according to this passage of Scripture, personally by Jesus. Each one of them has been set free by Jesus. The passage says the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. He had healed them all. He had set each one of them free and they knew him personally because he was the one who did it. I can imagine just a little bit 
about this freedom that comes because he has too set me free. He has too set you free. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you're following him in obedience to what he has called us to do as his people, then we too have been set free. Here are three women. And Jesus' message to them as they, as they went out from village to village and place to place was, here's the message of the king. Here's the message that is being proclaimed. The word preached in that is another word for evangelism. He is preaching and evangelizing to the world as he goes from place to place. And his message is the same. It is the king who is, has a herald. A king who has a herald does not speak his own message. He speaks on behalf of the king and the king only. And Jesus is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of his father. And the good news was this, that God has fulfilled his promise and that he has sent me, Jesus, as his Messiah and King and the one who will rule on this earth and suppress all unrighteousness. The heart of Jesus' message was that he alone is Lord and he has the right to rule over our lives. It's foreign and it is unbiblical to say, I have accepted Jesus as my Savior, but I do have not accepted him as my Lord. If he is not your Lord, he is not your Savior. And if he is not your Savior, because he is not your Lord, you are not in the kingdom of light. You're still in the kingdom of darkness. And that kingdom of darkness is Satan's rule, not Christ's rule at this moment. The point is that these women have been healed of many diseases, have been cured of evil spirits. Jesus has preached that God is king, that I am his Messiah, and that men must submit to my rule. And these women here had personally experienced Jesus, had personally experienced him as Lord. And here in this passage, it lists these three, and it says that each one of them not only knew him personally, but each one of them served him. A non-ministering Christian is also foreign to the word of God. Every person whose life has been changed by Christ is a servant or a minister of Christ, period. We are servants of his. If we are his people, we are servants of his. The question is, how well are we serving? How well are we ministering in his name? Chris is going to uh, put a, a PowerPoint up. I wanted to show you because he lists three ladies here. The first one is Mary Magdalene. This is a picture of Israel. And it's listed in three different ways. It's the one on my left as I look at it. Yeah, it's on the left. Galilee at the top, Samaria in the middle, Judea in the bottom. Okay? If you have really good eyes and you can see all the way up, the little blue area in the top is called the Sea of Galilee. And you can look to the left of that, and it says Magdalia. Right there, that is where Mary was from. She was Mary the Magdalene from Magdalia. And Jesus's, Chris, if you'd help, a little bit to the left there, his home base was Nazareth. That is where Jesus resided. That was his hometown. That is where when he came to preach, he did not do many miracles because he said a prophet in his hometown is not honored. Now, below that, below uh, Galilee, comes down to Samaria, which was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. They were kind of bred together. And then at the bottom is Judea. And then you see right below Judea is the capital city of Israel, which is Jerusalem. There is a place where Jesus went as obedience to the word of God. And there is where he ministered from time to time. But his main ministry was in the northern part of Israel, in Galilee. And one of the ladies there, thanks Chris, one of the ladies there was named Mary. 
It tells us that she was a lady from whom seven demons were cast out. Seven demons were cast out of her. Seven, we don't know if that was seven in specific number or seven as it means often in scriptural language, complete. Maybe she was completely full of demons. And God, Jesus, cast them out of her. And because of that, she would follow him and serve him and indeed give of her own resources for him. The second one that is listed there is Joanna. Joanna is an interesting thing that's listed here. She is the wife of Cusa, who is the manager of Herod's household. So she was a person of means. She is a person who had probably great means because her husband was the manager, I believe, the household, the assets of, of Herod, the Tetrarch. So here is one who is in the household of, of a um, Gentile, I mean a Jewish leader, and here he is, his wife is a follower of Jesus. Now we don't know, but we can assume that was something that Cusa was all right with. Doesn't say that there was any hardship about her following and ministering to Jesus. It just says that she did. And when she did, she was doing because of what her name means. Joanna means Jehovah has shown favor or the Lord is grace or the Lord gives graciously. It is because of what the Savior had shown her had favored upon her that she then left what she was doing. She got up, followed him, and she served him. The third lady that is listed here by name is Susanna. This is the only time in scripture that she is mentioned. Not mentioned any other time in the scripture and we know nothing other about her. But what we know about her is certainly enough. We know that she was one of the women who were there, who left things to be able to go with Jesus as he ministered from town to town, village to village, carrying the news of God. Can I tell you that Jesus was, was benefited by having these women? Women were important to Jesus's ministry. Women are important to this ministry. Women are important to every ministry. And in this one, Jesus was, was taken care of and the resources of these ladies. And then the very next thing says that there were many others. We don't know how many, many were, but we can assume that there were more than just a handful. The ladies would come together and they would, they would go from town to town and they would provide for Jesus. Jesus would preach and he would talk and he would share with the community that he is sharing the message of the kingdom of his father. And over and over and over again, they are there behind the scenes, not being seen, not out front, but definitely serving in his ministry. What do you need, Jesus? What can we do for you today? Great message. Wonderful word today, Jesus. And blessed all over again. Oh, by the way, can I tell you? Thanks for saving me. Thanks for making me a part of what you're doing. It is my privilege to serve you. And that is what we ought to be as Christians. When we have been set free, when we have been, been found not guilty because Christ has paid all our sin debt, we ought to find great pleasure in serving our Lord. This passage shares that each woman not only served him, but each woman shared out of their own resources. They didn't have an offering that was taken up for them to pay their way on a mission trip. They paid their way as they went, and they paid not only their way, but the way for Jesus and his disciples. In 
in this passage of scripture, we can only imagine the hearts of the ladies as they recall how they ministered to Jesus. How they had helped him to meet his material needs. But you know what is great about these women? Not just in two passages of scripture from Luke chapter 8. What is great about this passage of scripture is this is not the last time that we see these ladies. This is not the last time. No, they would follow him. They would serve him. They would provide for him all the way to Jerusalem at the end of his ministry. All the way to the cross. Hold your, no, you don't have to hold your finger. Turn with me. Keep going over to Luke. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. A very somber chapter speaks of the trial of our Lord, of his false conviction. Speaks of the sentence that was given to him to be crucified along with two thieves. It describes the crucifixion. It shares about Jesus walking to the place of the skull. The very end of the passage talks about his death. And beginning at the very end of the scripture of chapter 23, it talks about his burial and how he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Look at verse 50. There was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, and a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he came from Judean town of Arimathea. And he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Why? Because Jesus had proclaimed the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body and they took it down and they wrapped it in a linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut out in a rock in which no one had yet been laid. And it was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was about to begin. Verse 55, the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. And then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. And they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Do you see that? Not only in his life, but in his death, they are still giving. They are going home. They see him put into the, into the tomb. They see the stone rolled in front. They know that there's more preparation, but the Sabbath is coming. And in order to obey the Sabbath, we have to be able to stop and to come back again. And they go home and prepare spices. And I believe it is alluded to, it was out of their resources that they did so and out of their love for him. But you know what's cool? These are the same ladies that the angel speaks to. The same ladies that Jesus would, would, uh, would appear to on the day of his resurrection. Look at verse 1 of chapter 24. Here's three days later on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and when they entered they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus and while they were wondering about this two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them and in their fright the women bowed their faces to the ground but the men said to them why do you look for the living among the dead 
He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, be raised again. And then they remembered his words. And when they had come back from the tomb, they told all, the, all these things to the eleven and all the others. And it was Mary Magdalene, there it is, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told them, told this to the disciples, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Wow. What a great example. What a great day to be able to honor women. You know what? God didn't have to have Luke write that in their scripture. He could have left those two, two verses out about Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna, and the other women. Because we often read over them and we do not take any thought to them. He could have left them out, but he didn't. And you know why? He wanted to honor them. And he not only honor them for us here today, but to honor them by being there at the tomb that morning and hearing the angel say, why are you looking for the one who's not a dead? He's alive. And we know Mary Magdalene was the first one to see him. The very first one to see him. Wow. What a great example for us today on how to serve the Lord. And so here I have some homework for you. I have a challenge for you based upon these ladies for you this week. And here it is. What is one thing that you can do this week to serve the Lord? One thing that you can do this week to serve the Lord. Before we meet again next Sunday, you will have completed one thing of service to our Lord. What would it be? You could serve one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can serve someone who is less fortunate than you are. Scripture says pure religion is to look after the widows and the orphans. Hope you got your Bible still open. Turn with me if you would over to Matthew and we close with this. Matthew chapter 25. For there is a time coming when the Lord is going to separate his people from those who are not his people. He is going to separate the sheep from the goats, just like a farmer separates, separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep on his right, the goats on his left, he is going to separate them. There's a beautiful passage of this saw in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. Then the righteous ones on his right will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you some clothing? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it unto me. I would say that if Jesus was here this week and Jesus said, serve me before this week is over, we would break every, everything we ever thought about doing this week to serve him. And you know what? He has ascended back into heaven, but he is still here. And he is saying, you can serve me when you serve others in my name. You serve one of the brothers or sisters in this room this week. And he says, it's just like you're serving me. Just like it. 
I got a phone call. Uh, actually, I got a text message from a good friend of mine in, in uh, Hanover yesterday morning. And she texted me and said, I, I was reading the scripture and I came across John 12, 25. And I remembered how you love that scripture. And I just wanted to, wanted to encourage you with that. The scripture says, those who love their life in this world will lose it. And those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. I had to write her back and I said, Sue, thanks for sharing that with me, but honestly, I don't remember sharing about that. Getting kind of old, I can't remember all those things. She wrote back and said, yeah, I understand that. We're getting a little old too. Somewhere in time, she remembered a passage of scripture that I had shared and it meant something to her. And when she read it on Saturday morning, not only did she want to feel the encouragement of God's word and the memory that came back to her, but she wanted to be able to share that moment with me. And that was a blessing to me. And we have not talked in probably two years. She has been here and sang on a couple of different occasions and maybe soon she'll be back again. But it reminded me that I need to get myself out of the center of my view. I need to put somebody else in the center. I need to put Jesus in the center. And when I put Jesus in the center, then everybody else is Jesus in which I can serve. But if I've got myself in the view, trying to hold on to my life, the scripture reminded me I'm going to lose it. Maybe I'm not going to lose my life physically, certainly not going to lose it spiritually, but I'm going to lose whatever I'm doing in those times in which I've got my eyes set up on myself as an opportunity to have ministered for the Lord. And I've just wasted the time that he's given me looking at myself. You ever think about that? I think way too much about myself. I think too much about my needs and what I want to do. And when you have an eye problem, the best thing to do is get the eye out of the way and put Jesus back on the place where he needs to be the center of your view. I am going to contact Jim Ball this week and send you some reminders through the prayer chain. One item of service this week, and I look forward to what God is going to do in this place next Sunday as you serve him intentionally this week. I think a good place to start is where Femi started us, is to ask the Lord. You don't have to come up with it yourself. All you have to do is say, Lord, I am making myself available to serve you this week. What would you have me do? And if your eyes are open, there'll be opportunities of ministry all around you. And you will find joy as these women found joy in the ministry for the Lord. And you know what else? Don't forget there's unexpected blessings that come. Who knows, Jesus might show up, show yourself, show himself to you this week in a remarkable way. I pray that for his glory this week.